Bender. Uh, we're a founder member of the CEO Leadership Forum. Um, I think today you're going to have uh, an interesting experience because this is all about building a state culture. Okay? Um, how does the organization adapt for growth? And culture is going to be a very big point of this. Uh, this is our breakdown today. Um, we're, we're going to have a little icebreaker to start us off. And then Mike Roman from, from ADP and Nicole McMurray uh, from Apple One are, are going to speak to us on world-class strategies for growth and take you through an, an interactive exercise. Then we're going to break. Of course, feel free you know, to, uh, to do what, what, what you need to do if uh, you need to use the bathrooms and so forth, which, uh, which I'll share in just a second. Um, but uh, then at 10.05, we're going to have Bernie um, come up. For those who know, know Bernie, he's a, he's a real treat in, in his world. Uh, and um, then uh, you see uh, at about 10.45, we're going to have a spotlight, a school spotlight, and, and that will feature Daryl Dixon of Ballantry. Uh, then following that, it's tax reform and its impact, and we'll have a little um, interview on the new tax law. Uh, and, and its impact on growth going forward. And then to close us out will be Ken and Birch, who will, um, uh, who will take us through a very interesting exercise. I want to say it's very compelling on, uh, on uh, understanding your most compelling truth in your company and how that impacts culture. So it's a full, de you know, it's a full deck that we've got. Um, one thing that, for those of you who have been here before, you, you know our connection with Valencia College. The idea here is, is to connect the students to folks like you, all right? Um, we are actually, this group and a second CEO Reform group in Orlando is made up of a total of 19 companies that have come together to put these on and at the end of the day, provide scholarships to students that are going into the new four-year business degree. I don't know if you, you heard that. I'm going to let, let my friend Nasser share about that. But this organization, CEO Leadership Forums, is going to give up to 50 scholarships to those first eligible students going into that, that program in August. Okay? So that's a very big thing um, that we are trying to, uh, to get the word out about. Second thing being, some of you who are in this room could be potential employers for part-time jobs for these students in their junior and senior year. So really neat stuff. This is all how the rubber meets the road um, in, uh, in your organizations, how you get talent um, early, train them early, and hire them um, right out of school. That's really, really cool stuff. Okay, so that's this start. What I, what I want to do here, because I know our time will be tight, is I'm going to bring up Nasser Dayat who is a terrific friend uh, and, and, and my main contact here at the college. But just share a few words about where the college is and where it's going. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm Nathan Haddad. I'm the uh, Assistant Vice President for uh, Workforce Education at Valencia College. I've been in the college for almost 26 years. And they keep asking me when, when is the time. I said any time, not any moment, but I'm here. But I'm not going to retire. But uh, uh, it's really, truly a pleasure to work for the, such a great institution. And uh, to give you a uh, couple of minutes about the college, uh, we just celebrated our 50th anniversary uh, a few months ago. And we had folks like you, yourself at our advisory council, which we had over 200 plus individuals participating in our uh, 50th anniversary. It was a breakfast event. Uh, it was supposed to start at 8 o'clock by 7.30, the room was packed. So that tells you how connected our advisory members are to our students, our programs, and so forth. At the college, we currently have eight campuses serving over 70,000 students. And our ninth campus is really soon to be open downtown Orlando. And that's a joint partnership with UCF and the School of Culinary and Hospitality and, uh, and the additional media. And uh, they all will be moving down to downtown campus. Um, we currently offer uh, one associate arts degree that, as we all know, is goes to the transfer path to the uh, UCF and other state universities. We have 36 associate science degrees, uh, uh, almost 98 to 100 uh, short-term college career certificate programs. And uh, as of uh, 
few months ago, we received the approval for the latest two baccalaureate degrees, one baccalaureate degree uh, Bachelor of Science in Nursing, and the other one baccalaureate degree <coughs> in the uh, Business and Organizational Leadership. And that's the one that the uh, CEO Leadership Forum was very instrumental to help us to, to build it up. And uh, Jeff and the team came uh, to Tallahassee in front of the Department of Education folks and commissioner and tell how important that degree was. So both programs, nursing and the business, will be accepting, are accepting students right now. And the first class will be offered this coming summer term. So that will bring the baccalaureate degree for Valencia College up to five. And uh, we are also looking at another potential baccalaureate degree that you may, some of you may find interesting, and that would be Bachelor of Science in the software development. Uh, that's an area that we believe is a tremendous need, and, uh, and uh, a lot of folks are talking about it, and uh, right now that program does not exist in this area. So that's a major baccalaureate degree we're looking at to offer, hopefully in a couple of years, will be up and running. Uh, so welcome to Valencia, and uh, we have some of our wonderful students here to, uh, at the table. And uh, please come and sit at the table. You sh we shouldn't be sitting at the table, you know. And uh, anything you need, let us know. And uh, if you need to know where the bathroom is, on my right, a little bit down, back is built on your right. And uh, anything we can do to make your stay enjoyable, let us know. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Okay. Um, as, as Dasser mentioned, we, we have some students. Raise their hands. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Look at that. Okay. All right. Um, and and as, as this program um, moves on, we're going to actually try to try to integrate some of this in, into some of the course curriculums. But this is something that we will aspire to as time goes on. All right. Well, you see this, this graphic here. The, the only reason why I share it is because um, we've done about uh, seven or eight of these in the past two years. And we have polled, prior to these events, the, um, uh, the uh, participants' feelings of concern in these major areas, okay? So I just want to share this with you because though we didn't do it with this group, the fact is what we're talking about, okay, today is a result of a very high feeling on growing value, okay? companies are growing today, culture is a very important part of the growth plan. So we're going to, uh, you know, um, speak about that a little bit later. Okay. What we're going to do first, before we bring Mike and Nicole up, is we're going to do a little icebreaker. We're going to move through this, all right? It's going to be a little fun, but I'm going to focus it right here, just here. And all you're going to do is you're going to pair up, and one person is going to interview the other, and you're just going to basically get three pieces of information. Okay, my my name and my title in my in my company, all right, and um, what you do in ten seconds. And then what is one unique thing that nobody knows about you? Okay, right, one unique thing, and just have fun with it. But we're going to try to get this done in 10 minutes. So you got one minute each to interview each other. Go. <laughs> No, you are, you're, you're introducing him. Okay, this is uh, Brad Manson. Uh, so it's easy he is, now. Uh, oh, yes. He's uh, going for lasers and photonics. He's a lab assistant here at uh, Valencia. For the back course, um, a lot of what doesn't know, a lot of people call him Matt, and he actually likes can, can, uh, being called Brat. <laughs> it's one of those weird things. Like, that's very know, interesting. People know me for years, call me Matt. Okay. I, I just go with it. Good stuff. All right. There you go. So this is uh, Rob Johnson here. Uh, he is, has a major focus in uh, robotics and mechatronics, cool. as well as electronics. And he was still pondering what that secret was. And that's where we're kind of at on this issue. Interesting. <laughs> OK. All right, Bernie. Stand up, buddy. I just stand up. You standing? Um, <laughs> this is Evelyn Black. She's new for a large construction company called Jay Raymond. She's in the type of new role. And her 
thing that no one in the room knows is she actually is going to become a nun. But instead of going to HR. HR. And um, not too many years ago, ran the San Diego Rock and Roll Marathon. Oh, nice. Whoa. 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 All right. Uh, this is Tom. He's the president of Highmark Construction. They focus on commercial office and retail. Uh, the big thing uh, about him is that not only does he run that, but he also is a consultant to his clients. That's sort of a side thing that he's not supposed to do because I don't know if he gets paid for it, but he does it. <laughs> <laughs> this is Tony. He's the uh, head of the foundation for Nemer's Children's, oh, yeah. and uh, he, he likes to play golf a lot. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, Bob Daly. He's the vice president for Daly Enterprises, and uh, he's one of seven children. There you go. <laughs> Uh, this is Justin. He's a student here at uh, Valencia in uh, studying electrical engineering. Uh, he's got a couple more semesters here, and then he's going to move on to uh, UCF. Uh, his uh, unique thing is he doesn't study on the weekends. So I asked him, well, what do you do? He says, I play video games. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, wow. This is Jim Bowie, if I pronounce it right. He is with UCF. He helps entrepreneurs. And that's the thing to process, I guess. Mm -hmm. And he has a famous relative from Dalma. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is Tom Dillon. Tom's with Valencia, and he oversees the computer labs and several of the buildings, and also the uh, the 3D prototyping and makerspace. And uh, he's getting another degree in elect electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. This is Myra. She's a second uh, year student here at, at uh, Valencia. Uh, her goal when completing her uh, studies is to have her own company and employ people and help people. She also wants to also engage in missionary work. Um, this is Ray Watson. We're senior nexus. Uh, he facilitates CEO uh, like groups and bringing CEOs of like second and stage companies together to challenge one another to like achieve uh, achieve success and. <laughs> I don't know if you guys counted today, but there's an odd number of people sitting here. <laughs> I'm David Piranowski, I work with an insurance group over here in Benefits. Um, so, nice to meet you. What's unique about, oh, about me? Um, one of these days we're going to one of these conferences to get a Bernie. I'm going to guess the Bernie. <laughs> there you go. This is Neil Salmon. He's the CEO of the Salmon Retail Group, and uh, he owns some franchises throughout the state of Florida. Some O's and plant smoothies and Phoenix Salon. And uh, one of the things about Neil, he was a former racquetball player, got second in the state in his younger days. So. There you go. Uh, All right. 
All right. Um, this is David Pope. He's into uh, his company is called Commercial Business Funding, and uh, they do specialty finance of funding receivables. He's the CEO. And what's unique about David is he raised pheasants uh, in his home state of Nebraska. Uh, this is Marina. She's a business student uh, at Valencia. And what's your last name? Thank you. Right, because I couldn't say that. <laughs> and uh, her, what's interesting is that she was uh, born in Brazil, but raised in China, and speaks um, three languages, English, uh, Portuguese. And then, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this is Michael Logan. He's with Apple One. He's the vice um, president for regional in Florida and Puerto Rico. And he's, well, one out of 13? Yeah. 13 kids. Yeah. Wow. wow. Nine sisters and three brothers. <laughs> God bless you. Wow. And, and then we have um, two, two folks who uh, just got here. Um, go ahead and, and go ahead share Don about yourself. Um, Don Hess, I'm Vice President of B&B Enterprises in Winter Springs, Florida. And something... Something unique about you that nobody knows. Uh, I drove race cars for 18 years. I won four championships in Florida. Right on. Right. 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 Hi, I'm Joy. Um, I'm a career changer, former guidance counselor, now studying business management here at Valencia, hoping to secure a position in human resource management. The unique thing about me is I'm from the Bahamas. Yeah. I think we, we, had, a, we had a few stragglers pop in here. Okay. Um, why don't you... Uh, Introduce yourself, and actually, we have a chair right here. Okay. And over here. And here. I'm, uh, my name's Rodney Herb. I'm uh, one of the vice presidents at uh, Urban Young Insurance in here in Orlando. All right, terrific. All right, yeah, see. And then yourself. Uh, my name is Kelly uh, Harold, and I work at Universal Studios. Okay, terrific. Great. Okay. All right. We did that pretty good. I'm, I'm shocked. We went through uh, about 20, 22 people uh, in nine minutes. So, great job. Okay, we're going to move fast. All right, um, first up on deck, Mike Roman and Nicole McMurray have become really great friends um, uh, and great collaborative partners. I, I will say that if, um, if uh, uh, collaboration, spirit of collaboration and professionalism and a whole lot of humor, you know, uh, these two are actually that. So, I'm going to, it's, it's my pleasure just to bring up Mike Roman and Nicole McMurray. Hi, everyone. This thing is on, my mic? Yep. Is it on? Okay. It's, on. it's exciting. Like one, two, it's like, there right. we go. Um, I'm Michael Roman. Uh, I've been with ADP for 15 years now. Um, anyone heard of us? Probably, maybe, somehow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we started the idea of doing some outsourced payroll. Um, moved into human capital, which I think is a lot more interesting, and we're going to get into the reasons why, but we really are focused on trying to help companies manage their people side of it, and we work very well with partners like Yay. Nicole. So I'm Nicole McMurray. I've been with Apple One in March. It'll be 14 years, and I run the Orlando market, and my job is to have great people and great companies meet, and it's my passion. It's what I love to do, and I get to share a little bit of what I do with you today. So thanks for having me. I know. Thanks for having us. And, and what we're going to talk to you about today is, is something that I think is in front of a lot of people's minds, but it doesn't get the attention that I think it deserves. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll ask one of our colleagues here in a little while to explain why. It's people and culture. Um, you know, businesses always have to have a lot of employees, but how do you get them? How do you find them? How do you retain them? How do you get the most out of them and make them as happy as they can be? Well, you've got to develop the right culture. We're here to explain to you a little bit about how we got where, where that we are today and then going to go through an exercise to help you kind of think about that critically about your company. So what we've seen over time is really a change in the way business is done. Uh, if we think about the early, I just got done listening to a book. Um, it was a, at the turn of the century, actually in the, gold, in the Gilded Age they called, it was about uh, Westinghouse and Edison and how they competed to who... Uh, who was going to do the, who uh, created the light bulb. It's called the end of night. I think it's the last days of night. So those were older businesses. Um, 
manufacturing there was pretty simple. They, they, the more people they had, the more they got out of them, the more work they could do. What we've seen over the past 20 years even has been a dramatic difference. Um, and it's been because of these factors. We've seen changing political and economic conditions. I think we can all agree in the past 10 years. There's so many changes taking place, local, regional, national, international levels, from political shifts to uh, economic changes to the globalization of the marketplace. It's, it's made us all have to work and think differently about business. Digital, um, I'll go back to the last days of night. Um, you know, they were still doing plans in hand. They were going through, going through massive, whenever Edison would go through, he went through uh, more than, I think, 1,100 permutations of ter certain types of filament and even 12,000 other permutations of the bulb. He could, had to do that physically. These days, digital, he can do all that. You can model it. We have some, we have some of that going on here in Central Florida, the modeling and simulation industry. So we're seeing a lot of the change. We're all having to adapt to that. Workforce. Your employees today, and I think Nicole mm -hmm. will point to this as well, mm -hmm. it's, I mean, they expect to be able to do things outside the office. Yeah, absolutely. And, and everything's changing. We are in an employee led marketplace right now and, and I'll get into that a little bit more but these are the discussions that we're having with our clients. The world is changing and we just need to be aware and embrace it. Yeah, it's, we've heard the reference of the gig economy. So it's, you know, individuals who have part-time gigs, Uber, Lyft, others. How many businesses will not only employ full-timers but also have contract workers, 1099s, outsource yeah. outsource vendors for certain things yeah oh, okay them? yeah yeah we all have them uh we have them at adp we'll have individuals that we used to have service centers where they would all be located in one place then we went to home shoring and now we're doing a hybrid we have a big service center in maitland but we have tons of individuals home shored why that may be how we get the best talent in some areas mm -hmm. so we got to adapt to that as a business and then changing talent demands, not just where they work, how they work, how you communicate with them. And that actually mm -hmm. gets into the cultural piece, really. Um, the expectations truly are that you're going to adapt to what they need. But why do you have to adapt? Well, this. There are less workers out there. This, can, this is one of many charts we have. Um, it shows in 2015, I think this is the pointer. Oh. Number of open positions exceed new hires. That is why unemployment is at 4%, but it isn't really? Yeah, so unemployment right now, the latest statistics we just got this week, it's at 4.1%, but for degreed individuals, it's 2.8%. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so that means that there are less individuals out there. And if you really think about it, if you think about the 4.1 or the 2.8, you can probably take off part of that, maybe a percentage point, due to individuals that may have, may not be in the world, or they may not be qualified for certain jobs. The message is you're having to compete for every new employee against another company. You are having to take them from somewhere else. Chances are they are not in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, one, of, one of the accounts I work with is in medical. RNs for every, if an RN applies for one job, they have seven other jobs they can apply for. LPNs, <laughs> I think it's one to 12. <laughs> They have choices. It's not like it was back, I'll go back to Westinghouse and Edison, where, hey, if you want to yeah, you want to work for me, you got to come work for me and on my terms. It's been flipped. Employees now are dictating the terms by which they work and what they do, types of jobs, how they paid, how they're dealt with. If you're not focused on a business, you, you're, you've fallen behind, and that's where culture comes in. This didn't come out fully, but let me just... This is a Deloitte and Touche uh, survey. They put in here, you know, we talk about what's most important. What are the top concerns of business leaders? I would say that all of these careers, talent, employee experience, performance, leadership, all those things, that's all culture. That's all routed in culture. Culture is this thing that we can't really mm -hmm. define. You love to use the word nebulous. Yes. That's your big word I that do. I just learned from Mike. Yeah, it, it's a situation where you have to understand the employee, and that understanding is changing on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, through multi-generations, we've got millennials, mm -hmm. all the way to baby boomers, yeah. even Gen Xers, Gen, Xers, Gen Y. Gen y. Right. Um, They're all coming into the workforce. They are. Mm -hmm. And you know, as you go through this transition, you have to understand what's important to them. 
So that's, I think, a really quick, that's a really critical thing. So that's the landscape of what we're in. Mm -hmm. Business has changed. You can't operate the way you used to. You've got to understand the political dyna dynamic, understand what the employees and the workers are demanding, understand the role of technology and how that plays into your business, but also towards the employees and the importance of something like culture. Yeah. I'm going to take this over. Thank you. Hey, little buddy. You got it. So I was talking to our CEO, Janice Bryant Howroyd. I was just with her at a management meeting. And I asked her the message that she would deliver to CEOs or leaders of companies. And the thing that we talk about the most at Apple One is that you matter. You absolutely matter. If you're in this room, if you're learning, if you're leading, you have been gifted with this amazing responsibility and burden and an overall idea to move the culture and to embrace your organization and to move it forward, to make it a place where people want to work. I heard a sermon one time and he was talking about raising children and he said at 18 when your children pull in, their drive, in your driveway, it's because they want to. And so we want to create an environment where people want to come to work every day, where they want to stay. These buzzwords, stay culture, uh, engagement, uh, all of these different things that we're learning and hearing, they're so important to how we're going to grow as an organization. So my VPs in the room, we just ran a manager's meeting for all of our leaders, and we based it off the book Great by Choice by Jim Collins. And it, it, it's such an excellent book. I would highly recommend reading it. But I love what he says here because he says people are creative, people are productively paranoid, people lead, people build teams, people build organizations, people build culture. Are you guys seeing a pattern here? People exemplify values, pursue purpose, and achieve big, hairy, audacious goals. Of all the luck we can get, people luck, the luck of finding a great mentor, partner, teammate, leader, friend is the most important. He talks in the book about return on luck, and, and we all get chances to meet people, and, and luck hits us every once in a while. It's what you do with that luck that makes it important. So just yesterday, I was coaching somebody, a, a new manager out of California, and she's having an issue with culture and development, and that's what I do a lot for Apple One, among the other things that I do. And she said, I'm telling people to be excited, I'm showing them, and no one's listening. And I said, you are so adorable. You think that when you say something, people are going to listen to you. I love that. That is just so great. And you don't have children, do you? And she didn't. She had a cat. Um, and, and so I just, <laughs> yeah. what was it? Uh, oh. Yeah, that's the thing. Cats don't listen either, right? Uh, but she had this idea in her mind that she would just say something and it would happen. And we all know that it is intentional. Culture is something that we develop and grow, and we show and we tell, and it's beautiful when it works. And so my goal today is just to ask you some questions. They're going to be in your book, too, but if your heart even flickers, if you even think, ah, I need to work on that, then please write it down and let's create a plan. My team interviews 300 to 500 people a month. And we hear the stories of what is going on in our marketplace. We know that there are companies that are not getting this right because they're coming to us for help. And so if you can get it right, then we are so excited and we are so grateful. And the fact that you're here is step one. Is talent acquisition a laser, a laser focus for your organization? Are you methodical and consistent to your uh, uh, approach in recruiting? Okay, that's going to be something that's really important as we look at the marketplace, as we hear unemployment. We need to be, if we can, having lunch, interviewing our competitors, having a plan to be consistently focused on recruiting, to, to shoot that, to be productively paranoid, to know that somebody could leave your organization at any minute, and do we have the pipeline coming in to be able to work alongside of that? Then there's another one on here. Are you building a culture of continuous learning, adaptability, growth, and personal development. Do your people know that they matter? You know, we talked about in the olden days, it was uh, this is your job and you come to work every day and you're expected to work and you go home. But do your people know that they matter to you? That's, as we hear this word culture and it's so nebulous and it's so big, how do we define it? And, and I think sometimes we can define things by asking ourselves if they exist in our organization. Is your company designed with the employee engagement as a function of your employee experience? And do you assess this? Are you assessing job fit, manager impact, culture, team dynamics? 
when somebody walks into your organization on day one, I know we do this at my company, when you sit down and you start with us, we tell you welcome to your $100,000 opportunity. We're so excited you're here. We want to walk you immediately through the career path that you have in front of you. Whether you take it or not, we want to let you know that we care. And so are we doing these things as an organization on day one to say, this is where you can go, this is what it looks like if you stay with me, grow old with me. In my industry, the turnover percentage is 65 to 70 percent. It's insane. Nobody wants to do what we do. I have people with me 16 years, 5 years, 8 years, 10 years. There's a reason behind it. It's because we've created it and it's intentional. And let me add to Yes, there. please. So, so once again, on, you think about us, we start, we're a technology company. Payroll, HR, we do all the systems. So really, where does that come in? I can tell you in the past 14 years I've been working, I've never seen anything grow as fast as, as this part. Having design, making sure the employee experience is better. That's what it is all about. Mm -hmm. And it can't just be a one-on-one. -on -one. It's got to be it's got to be relayed and deployed multiple times and through multiple channels. Mm -hmm. Your managers have to do it. The you have to have the right technology and the process to do it. Mm -hmm. It's important that you continually reinforce it because everybody's so busy. Mm -hmm. We're so busy and if your employees don't know on a day-to-day -day basis in some way, some shape, some form that you make it easy for them to get what they need out of you, but also that you care about them in some way. They will leave. We've got uh, ADP to say the companies, uh, employees, and you've seen the same numbers. Employees, for all, if other things are equal, if they, if they get a job offer and one job offer is made maybe 10% less, but the other company that they, that's paying them a little bit less, they, have, they feel like they're part of something, they have the right tools to do the job, they know they can be successful, they have a path for growth and development, they will take the job that pays them less money because the other company has a more well-rounded package of information. It helps them, it cares about them as a whole, not just as a piece or a cog in the wheel, so. And I love when we talk about assessing job fit too. Sometimes our people uh, just might not be in the right roles and that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be a part of our company. And so evaluating that as well and assessing employee engagement. We have Ray in the room. If you guys don't know Ray yet, please get to know him. This is what he does and, and I just refer to client to him that's asking these questions how do we make sure that people are in the right roles doing the right things to move our mission forward and are we building a management team that engages and empowers employees I don't know if that exists in your organization but if not there's a lot of work and a lot of room to make this better and then are we leveraging technology to design and improve the workplace what does that mean I invited Evelyn uh, just a couple of weeks ago. I had lunch with the CEO uh, of J. Raymond Construction, and it's a $160 million company. We're sitting at lunch, and, and I'm just learning about the organization. And at the end, we were walking out, and I said, I, I just want to thank you. You have created a company where people love to work, and I'm so excited that there's people like you in the world. I even paid for his lunch, which I normally do. Um, but it was just, it, it was such a, a refreshing time and then he introduced me to Evelyn and I got to have lunch with her and and just learning about what she does she's in charge of HR but I think so many times we position HR as just a position within our company and I was so impressed with what she does the seat that she has at the table how she's helping the company grow so I asked her to be here so she can just share and she told me a story about technology and so I would ask you to share that of, of how when used correctly it can move an organization forward so So he's been doing it since 1989, a, you know, just like a pay-per-view checklist of 
type, type of review. Um, and he wanted to do something a little more grand, something with technology. So he had our IT manager go out and find a software that we could utilize that would help improve our employee engagement process and, and also utilize technology because we are very driven in, in that area in our company. But of course, it was our IT manager. So he did find a great software and he customized it the way he thought it, it should be and it was wrong. <laughs> so when they hired me, my first task was to take that great software, that great platform that was that that has absolutely improved our engagement process and make it you know HR friendly. Bring in the the the, the meat and potatoes of what employees need to see and you know need to work on in order to improve their their performance and feel successful. It's very goal centered. It's not just you know you pass, you fail. No, it's, it's, it's um, encouraging them to, to stretch themselves and, and develop goals um, that are going to improve not only their performance, but also their experience. So that was really great. And it, that wouldn't have happened if he wasn't deliberate in trying to create this culture and trying to improve the experience of the employees and, and having that always on the forefront of all our business decisions um, are always centered around what's going to help our employees and, and make them happy. So I love that. And, and it's amazing. So, so we can see that we can buy technology, and I think a lot of times that's a solution. We purchase something, and we think that that will make a difference in creating culture or enhancing culture. But if you don't have an Evelyn, or, or you're not the Evelyn behind what you do, then th you won't be able to see the full ROI on that. And so we're going to get more involved in that in our breakout session, but I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, and then do you have the people to believe and push your vision forward? Are they aligned with your leadership vision? And who's going to champion and, and advocate that message for you? If that's you, are we doing the greatest job that we can? If you have an Evelyn on your team, if you have people on your, te on your team, what are you doing to align them with that message to have a seat at the table? And so just one other thing I asked her to highlight today was, you know, John's moving towards retirement now, and you've been actively involved in the succession uh, transition. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about t that too and your involvement. Well, I mean, we'll all agree that is the number one, the biggest task an organization will undertake is, is developing their succession plan and of course, we've been in business for about 30 years, and I have so many employees that are so loyal to the company, but really they're loyal to, to my boss. Um, that's that's where that is. So deliberately creating um, a succession plan that's going to probably take us about five years to implement fully, um, making sure that we're communicating with them consistently, um, making sure that the people that are going to be stepping up into those roles of leadership are people that embody the same vision and values that John um, and, and his partners um, have instilled since the very beginning of the company has been paramount. So um, just, you know, it's, it, it, it has to be done right because our, our goal is that the agreement is in business for another 30 years easily mm -hmm. and into the future. And I think that um, the fact that they are, that this really paramount business decision is taken into account our employees and their longevity I, I, I think it's probably going to be the key of our success. I love that. And when I was talking to John, you know, it's just teaching his managers too, when you're at a company function, walk up and hug the kids and figure out how they're doing. And so it's just things like that as we talk about culture and the transition of culture. Those are so important if we want our organization to, to grow, if we want people to pull in the driveway because it's their choice. I don't know if this. There we go. Okay. So this is just a, a slide. We talk a lot. Eric was going to be here uh, from Strategic Partners to talk about benefits and, and what the new benefits look like. And so just to, when we hear benefits, we think 401k, medical, the things that our candidates are excited about now are flex time. And it's really looking at wellness programs, financial wellness, caring about the whole person. And you can see again, it's coming up, this, the work itself. It, so job fit, assessing that, that's on there. Company culture, again, it keeps coming up, it's this buzzword, but how do we define it? So one of the things that we're really passionate about when I uh, add talent to an organization is to make sure that they're gonna stay. That's, we wanna create that stay culture, it's so important. We, nobody likes the process of hiring. I haven't met a person yet that really loves it, and that's great job stability for me. I don't know if any of you in the room love placing an ad or interviewing candidates, and uh, it's, it's a lot. And so we get people in the door, and then we think that that's it. So an engagement program, when we're working with you, and these are in your book, but there's just seven easy steps to just really take into account. You have to get to know your people. Find out 
what makes them tick, what's important to them. When we're creating an engagement plan, we want to make sure that it reinforces the company's goals and priorities. We don't just create an engagement plan because we buy you lunch every day because we're excited to hang out in the conference room. We want to make sure that the end is in mind, that it's proportional to the achievement. If somebody does something spectacular, a $5 Starbucks gift card, I don't know. Is that, is that really going to send your message that you matter and thank you for what you've done for my organization? Or do we have to do a little bit more? Timely in presentation, that's your job. Or if you have a team that you're running, this is their job to make sure it's not, hey, last month, didn't you do something awesome? I was super pumped about that. Appreciate you, bud. It's timely in the moment. We are training a puppy right now, and when he misbehaves, we say it right then. We don't have a one-on-one -on -one with our puppy that you peed on our carpet eight times. So timely. Visible to others, that's going to be really important. Sincere gratitude expressed. I, I can't say that enough. The intention and sincerity behind something is so important. If you lack that, find somebody on your team that can deliver that message. Specific details of the achievement given. We say at Apple One that adjectives don't close deals, data does. So if you've done something and I say, she was spectacular, awesome, totally great, best day ever, really excited she did that, I'm not really setting a level of achievement for you to accomplish. If I tell a story that Stephanie processed payroll for 222 people during a hurricane, it was over $300,000 in billing and she didn't make one error, I feel like that's a pretty impressive goal. Right? And then personalize to the priorities of the individual, making sure that you understand what's important to your people. Stephanie on my team in the back, she loves cats. I still hired her. And uh, the other day, if you have a cat, it's OK. But uh, the other day, she did something just really awesome. And I, I ordered her a purse that looks like a cat. I would never wear it. But for her, she would love it. And it was personalized. I am Italian. I did something great for my boss a couple of years ago. Oh, there's the cat purse. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so cute. Uh, I did something great for my boss, and he sent me a whole thing of salami to my house. And so Lauren wouldn't like salami, but for me, that was pretty awesome. I was really excited about that. Duggan, I was swollen for a week. But it was personalized. It was intentional. And I just really appreciated that level, right? And so you need to, I could never do this job without Lauren who's with me every single day without Stephanie. And I know we know these things, but do our people know them? And then just lastly, again, we, we hear the word engagement and then how do we get started? We just really encourage you as leaders in the room to set SMART goals, right, with your people to, uh, to, to make sure that it's aligned. And SMART just means specific and strategic, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time frame. So I can't just say, I want to do this. It's, I want to do this with you. Let's talk about how we can get there together. And then I want to re reward you in a way that will show you that I love you and that I care. And then we'll really uh, bring through this together. Hey, you guys. Yes. <clears throat> so people are important. We all agree. Everyone thinks that, and once again, what, what was most impressive about your construction company, Emily, is that I haven't seen or heard of that level of commitment to culture, to people, to reviews, to structure um, in that industry and a lot of other companies. You'll see a lot of construction companies, uh, and I do work with a number of them, it could be HVAC, plumbing, uh, concrete, whatever, there's so many electrical. <clears throat> it, it, I haven't seen them catching up yet. You guys are obviously ahead of the curve. You're, you're really far ahead of the curve, and it's important because that I think is one of the areas one industry needs to catch up because those workers are incredibly high demand. Uh, one of my neighbors runs a construction company. I live out in the Laureate Park area, runs a construction company. And we were just having a talk and I said, how are you doing on finding people for, for the new job? Because it's, 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 some, it's very hard to find people to, to, to do our jobs and even expand the business. I said, why? He goes, well, some of the jobs I have, I'd love to get someone in, but they can go get paid $25 an hour to wave a flag on I-4 as part of the I-4 Ultimate Project. He goes, I can't compete with that wage. I can't do it because I can't afford to pay that much. And it actually goes back to what we saw with the recent tax legislation. So legislation comes out, businesses' tax rates are going to drop <clears throat> you know, uh, significantly for some businesses. Where, whether it does or not, it to me is irrelevant because the response from the marketplace was, what did Disney do? thousand dollars raise benefits what did Bank of America do what did uh, AT&T do thousand dollars increased paternity leave increased paternity leave additional training 
as small, mid-sized businesses, you need to understand that. Because what's happened is whether or not you get money back, it's irrelevant. All job candidates now and even all your internal employees are now looking going, well, they got a $1,000 bonus. I, someone else got uh, a week's extra vacation. What am I going to do? Mid-market doesn't often have the, 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 width or the bandwidth or the resources to respond. The way you respond, though, can be by increasing the cultural aspects of the business. You don't have to spend money on a software. You know, what you have to do is be intentional with it. Put a plan together. Solve a call over it. If you have any questions, ask us about it. There are things you can do to increase the value of being an employee at your company without putting a dollar into it. And to your employees, look, if you can't, great, do it. But you've got to find a way to, to focus on that piece of culture and focus on that part of the business. So I give you guys, I, I guess some clients would probably love to talk to you about what you did. The challenge, though, is how do, you, how do you get there? How do you know where you have to go? The only way you know is you have to see where you are. So we're going to make this available to everybody. Um, ADP had a partnership with a company called the Hackett Group, international consulting firm. Um, it costs you nothing. Um, they do a benchmark survey. Um, Daryl did it for us. Thank you, Daryl, uh, earlier in the week. And the focus is to go through some questions, which we're going to do part of the exercise today to help you understand where you are as far as what your current structure is, where HR is. Because if you don't get the basics right of the business, it's hard to focus on culture. If you don't have the basic systems and processes in place and you don't have HR valued correctly or aligned correctly with your executives like you are with your executives, you're going to be all over the place. Just like the individual who bought the software, but when you came in, I, we don't know what we're doing with it. We're not doing the right thing. So. We're going to use our benchmark process. Um, Hackett's group, International 13, they do about 13,000 of these surveys a year. Um, they're a management consulting company. Once again, it's not commercial, I'm just validating and telling you why we picked who we did at ADP to partner with. Um, the idea is it gives you ideas on best practices. So like I said, we're going to go through some of it here and I'll walk through it in a second. Um, but Daryl, I want to ask you, you went through it. I mean, kind of, we, we talk a little, tell me what your thoughts were. <coughs> I've been in operations and worked on strategic plans for over 35 years and had never really thought about specifically HR. And, and by the way, I've been in recruiting and staffing and stuff like that. But to actually look at human resources as part of uh, up in the top or up in the C-suite, if you will, of your strategic plan, just had never really thought of it as that because it was more of a utility. It was a function that had to be done. It was compliance. Mm -hmm. um, it's gotten much more difficult um, for HR executives to do their jobs based on all the expanding, expanding responsibilities. But it really called out the fact that I had really not pulled it up to the highest level that I needed to from a strategic plan standpoint. Yeah, that, and that's, that's the intent. I mean, that really is the intent because we've got, if you have someone like an Evelyn on your bench and you're not using her, and use them with the knowledge I have, or maybe you don't have, or as lucky as to have someone like Evelyn on your bench. You've got to find someone, but if they are using them, you've got, you got to get them to the table. They are the ones that are going to help enable growth of the company. And no one's allowed to recruit Evelyn after this. No. Okay, that's yeah. the deal. Sounds like I'm giving a commercial. Uh, really, yeah. Sorry. We love Sorry. her. No, Sorry. no, no. Sorry. And we don't know where you are in the room. You know, we know their story and we love their story, but I'm sure there's so many other stories in here when we talk about culture. Neil works with Moe's. The second I walk in, I feel really welcome when I walk no, in. No, welcome to Moe's. I, I love it. I appreciate that, right? I love so it. So I don't know where you are in the room, and we'll, we'll begin to, to talk through that. Uh, but again, if you have any stories or examples, we're going to do our breakout sessions. We are excited to hear. Yeah, that. And, and that's where it's going to come out. So this one is actually pretty simple. So we're going to do five questions, um, and these are all in the book. So we're going to ask you what describes the strategy and goals for the HR function, right? You have a strategy. These are actually out of order. You have a strategy. I think the first one actually should be in there. Did it go through? Yeah, we lost some of the slides. Yep. All I right. have the book right here for you, Mike. Oh, let, let, me, let me pull the book. Yeah. So the first one you're going to have is... Um, there you go. There we go. The first two. There you go. Sorry about that. Yes, it's honestly answer these questions. So you'll have, let me make sure I get the right ones. Here, go through here, right there. It says, honestly answer these questions. These will be the five you're going to answer. We're going to do it in the breakout group. All right? But I just want you to see them. What are the areas of rank by importance where your team currently spends its time and effort? 
Should be page, not number. Yeah, yeah you got it right there. It's right next to your cost and productivity slide. So there's that yeah, first some of those, question. Yeah, it we, says, some of those got moved. Honestly, answer these questions. Right. We're going to ask you where your HR people are currently spending their time. So what we're going to do is we're going to have, when we break out into the groups, you're going to, we're going to have a leader. We're basically going to have everyone rank these one to five for each of your companies, and we're going to collate for each group and understand where everyone spent. So where your HR people are spending their time today. The next one is, same question, where would you as an executive like them to spend their time? And that. If, if it's you, or if you're in the HR function, right. please rank yourself. Or where, where do you think the company should be spending its time? Right. The delta here will often be, I have spent a lot of my time on technical aspects. I've got to move data in our payroll HR systems. I'd really rather focus on talent because you know how important it is. So we, this is the alignment with executives. Then you'll go through which, what's the strategy. We're not going to get into specifics. You have a strategy or you don't have one. Um, unfortunately, we see some of the other. Um, you have goals. You have stated goals. Once again, we want to understand if you have stated goals. And this is going to generate conversation. You know, what are the goals? How did you come up with those goals? Was HR involved in the creation of the goals from the C-suite from the C-suite level? And the last one is, do you use some sort of engagement or uh, yeah, an engagement study, a stay, a stay survey? Yeah. So I was just meeting with the chief administration officer. One of the things we're helping our clients with are stay interviews. So what does that mean? Evaluating performance after 30 days. We hired you. Is this job exactly what you thought it was? What can we help you with? What are you not getting? Who's really helping you? And then we implement it at a 60, 90 day, and then we move it on from there, depending on what our clients uh, would like to have from an employee engagement standpoint. But it just lets people know we have our finger on the pulse of the job fit and caring for them. So you go through those five, and then you'll see this. What we're going to do is literally for each one, you can do it in, the, in, in each page in your book. Mark one, two, three, four, five, which is most important. We'll collate, then we'll say, all right, and for group, num you know, for group number one, we came out and we, we, you know, we, uh, uh, we say we do have a, my company has stated goals. Uh, we have limited linkage between goals and our strategic plan. Okay, great. Three, you picked that. Tell, let's talk more about that. What is it? How do you, what do you mean they're limited? Are there certain areas you're not covering? What do you think could be done better? How do you think that's impacting the business? Um, and our facilitators will talk about that. We'll come up with a couple of those best practice ideas, some results and best practice, and we'll come out and share it with the group. We probably have, yeah. Yes. Strategic alignment is very, very well done. It's, it's have you in building the business plan, the overall plan for the company, have you thought about a people strategy and what it means? What it means to employ individuals and how you're gonna how you're gonna grow that aspect of the business? Not that, well, we've got a payroll system, we track time, whatever. No, no, no. Have you thought with intention that if I'm gonna grow this, I've got to make sure I have a plan around finding, attracting, and retaining people. But also, how am I gonna help them feel part of the business? Is it a family? Do you want the business to feel like a family or is it We didn't get to the time part of it. That's actually, we do that in, in our, in the overall benchmark. Um, for this one, honestly, is, for the first one is, where are they spending their time? Where, how much, in other words, you have to evaluate what time they're spending on it. If they're, for the first question, are they spending most of their time on technology, or are they spend it with, are they actually going back and forth? Are they working on aligning with the executives? Are they talking to the executives about, hey, we, we, we see this change in the marketplace. We need to make some adaptations. Does that help? If, if I can just add to that too, let's say you have an HR, do you have an HR function or is that you? Can I? Uh, I have a part-time HR. Okay, okay, so HR. So w when we look, is she strategically aligned? At, at this point, is she coming in? Are, are we talking about only payroll benefits, compensation? Maybe she's doing some plan strategies with you. Maybe she's encouraging you to buy some additional software to make sure that her job is easier. When she's having these conversations, are they strategically aligned with the enterprise goals of whatever that is for your organization? So is she moving towards that strategic alignment with you? If you continue to grow and she becomes full-time, would she have that, that seat at the table as a C-level executive with you to move her towards that like Evelyn? I don't know if that helps. One of the questions yeah. I have is, is a focus and a framework for this discussion yeah. is mm -hmm. 
what level of size yes. is, are the organizations? Because there's a very uh, right. vast yep. spectrum. And that's why we're breaking out into groups. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, we have people that just do it on their own. And, and we get that. And then we have people that have Evelyn in a whole department. Mm -hmm. So as we go out into our group, the, the reason for this is because we wanted to be mindful of not telling you what we thought you should hear, but what you actually would want to know. And so as we break out into the groups, that will be part of our discussion, right? We have Tony with Nemours. I, I work with their HR, they, ha they have a lot going on. Uh, and they have mission moments and things that, that leverage that why behind what we do. Um, so you might be in a group with him, you can get some ideas and move that forward. Mm -hmm. But yeah, as we break out into our groups, that will be part of the discussion that your facilitators will have with you, but great point, yeah. thank you. And the survey, and what we're gonna do, the survey when we're done, if anyone wants to, we can actually run you through the actual survey, mm -hmm. through the Hackett survey. Now that one is benchmarked on about a thousand employee company but they do 13,000 of them. And still what we find is, you know, Boundary's not that big, but the metrics that come out after it, the, the message is you gotta focus with it. And if you're not, it's the ideas of getting you intent upon your HR component with some specific, you know, prescriptive things you can do for the company. Okay? And then if you don't have HR, that's you, and then, you know, we have And even then, th but then even if it's not, yeah, you, you can still focus on some things, not everything, but, and then Evelyn was going to be a nun too, so we can have like prayer after, you know what I'm saying? If we work, so, so she serves two functions, it? right? So I want to make sure that we break out in groups that are appropriate because we have some students in the room too, which we're super three, pumped to hear, but not sure if we're experiencing this level of stress yet. Is that true, Justin? All right, good. Um, so I want to make sure, I, so let's go ahead and break out. We'll do one, two, three. No, we'll do Nicole, you got it? Yeah. Or, oh, you, or Jeff, you want to? Actually, all, uh, all the students, I'm going to have you step back, okay? Yeah. And we want you to, to, I'll have to observe from the outside. And I'm going to ask uh, this side. We got Don, Bernie, Eric, Lee, and uh, Daryl. That'll be one. This group here will be two. This group here will be three. Okay. And I guess you can handle this one. As group three. Graham, Love Andrew, you guys. This group in here, and then. Do we have a? Here. And I actually have all of the, well, I have the flip charts for the best practices. They are stationed right around here. So this group can turn back to that table. Oh. And Nicole will facilitate that. Okay. Mike, still Mike, because our group is going to rock. All right, let me <laughs> mute Going to make now. me do handwriting because I got, I'm, I'm a lefty, so. That we're talking about yes. in the best practice. So in our group, I put a heart because I love these guys. Um, but we had, you know, a wide range of companies. Rod, was Rod's organization has uh, 10 people in it. Neil, how many employees do you guys have now? 60. 60 right, and then David, you guys have a, a really senior experienced group. Uh, so we had a, a, wide, a wide variety. So for us, we feel like as a group, the overall message was a, a lot of HR is spending time on, on compliance. And where we really want them to be spending their time is engagement and talent management, right? So we get so busy doing the things that we do, the plans that we have, they, we have the best intentions and we're so excited, but we're not doing them. Uh, and so we've had a lot of 90 day reviews, right? Maybe yearly reviews, uh, but it's not as intentional as it could be. So we talked as a group about that. Uh, as far as a strategy, we're in development. So we might have an HR strategy, but it's not consistent. And so I think as a group, we evaluated what that approach would look like. Um, number four was my company has stated goals for HR and they're aligned with the plan. We're kind of in a hybrid role, right? Um, at Rod's company, he was telling us they led with culture. And so they hire people based on culture only, right? And in Neil's um, environment, he described it like Titanic because Moe's, right? You only have a couple of, of hours before they might jump ship. So, you know, I love the way that we approach that. So we're in a hybrid model. And then number five, uh, engagement it somewhat exists. So I think just to highlight the things we talked about today, it's not to <coughs> lecture at all, it's because we know that we can grow in these areas, and if we do, then we'll be the companies that are absolutely rocking. So, that's it. Any questions, concerns? Snack remarks, good joke? No, okay, okay. Okay, right. <laughs> okay well I think uh, our conclusions were pretty much commensurate with any small company. Uh, they were pretty much reversed. In other words, what we would like to be doing, should be doing, are, are not what we are doing. Uh, a construction company, which is, I gotta make payroll on Friday, regardless, everything else. So the, 
the mechanics of running the payroll piece of it uh, overshadow everything else. If we flip that, you know, everybody says yes, we should be doing the things that are building employee engagement that's getting, uh, addressing some of the things that you talked about earlier. But as far as time to do that in a small company, you are completely consumed with running the business, making payroll, cash flow, collecting the money, whatever it is, and do not have the time, although you know you would like to and should, have time to spend on that. I think the point was also made as you scale a company, uh, the gentleman worked for a company that you know had 150 employees. Uh, Myra worked, spent some time with Universal, obviously a HR department. So as you scale your company, you have resources in which to focus on some of these other things. But I think we all agree that what you said is, is if we can, is to build our payroll process into the culture of our organization and meets overall needs of the employee. And in a small company, I think the best thing you can do is just ask the question, interface with your people, be, be the face of your company, uh, because the dynamics of cash flow and, and, and that really override everything else that you would like to be able to do. And I think that was a consensus for the group. Good. And group three, awesome, by the way, I think my group rocked better. Oh yeah, I feel hard though, Mike. You're I, 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 I've got Ellen. You know, I got her on that side. So oh, no, ignore no, my no, handwriting. No, no. So we came up and ignore my handwriting, please. But I can I can summarize it pretty simply. Compliance and technology is the biggest. We had a couple construction companies. That was the biggest thing, and especially because it was just general compliance around. Um, that is where our focus was on process and getting the system efficient. Everyone did want to focus on talent, but what we also found out what is that most. Companies do have some sort of a structured HR strategy. Now, whether it's being followed and deployed, something else. Um, I think what we saw was one of the instances where HR doesn't have something. And I asked the question, so how do we get HR to the table? Maybe one of the hardest things to do. So if you're an owner and you do have someone like an Evelyn or someone else, are you letting them to the table? But how would you listen to them? And I think the information came out was metrics. HR's got to come up with information and numbers and speak, and I'll put it in these terms, speak the language of the C-suite. Got to speak their language. Come at them with whatever metric you can find out. I think everyone would agree if you had an HR person or even a different leader said, I've got these metrics to back up, we need to make a change, that's going to get your attention. You know, it's, it's going to put an emphasis on listening and, and, I, and speaking the language. HR's got to learn to do that, but C-suite, we have to allow them to do that as well. Um, and I think the other one, last one was engagement takes time. It is something that's important, but you were talking about what you do. I mean, it's just, it's a lot of work. You go to sites, you, you know, you engage, you talk to the employees, you talk to the managers, you go back with training. This stuff, engagement, which is culture, takes time, but it's worth it. Zero turnover. You haven't had turnover, your turnover is low as well, right? In, 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 in for at your, certain levels. At certain levels. That's rare in this group, so I would just say our message is going to be, look, even if you have a strategy, you have to go back and look at it. If you don't have a strategy, think about putting one in place, but listen to the people who are engaging your employees on a day-to-day -day basis. And if we want employees to know their worth, let's make yeah. it worth it, right? Yeah. One yeah. thing that's, you know, we, we have a discussion about younger generations and flexibility of the workplace and things like that, and, and compliance obviously is important, but compliance is, tends to be very rigid, mm -hmm. and so how do you strike that balance mm -hmm. between the rigidity of compliance that everybody has to essentially be treated the same with the flexibility of what is the expectation mm -hmm. for the younger generations coming into our businesses. Yeah. Does, any, does anybody in the room want to address that at all? Is anybody doing that, adding flexibility to compliance? Which yeah. I love that. <laughs> right? well, I mean, compliance people, I just want to body slam you. You right. drive me bonkers. Right? But yeah, but I know what he's saying yeah. because over the years, Please. I've been doing this 30-something years. Okay. What we used to do before, yeah. like I can't even say, hey, I'll buy you lunch. Right. Because I'll get sued from him because mm -hmm. I helped her. It, 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 it is ludicrous of, mm -hmm. of how it's changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, I've gotten sued more in the past four <laughs> years than I have in the past 30 hey, we, for, for stuff like that. I think we should just do our next line should be who got sued, right? Yeah, I mean, you heard that. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I think we have some attorneys well, in the room. Well, don't raise your There's hand. There's a lawyer in the back. So, you know, in our... Uh, <laughs> but, 
Yes, yeah. please. It's interesting. The one company in a huge company literally had an audit based on the Sarbanes Oxley stuff and all that stuff. They didn't record vacation time. I'm like, what do you mean you can't? You, you have to do that. So they looked it up. It's a company out of California. And they said, well, we have to record vacation time. Well, if you give vacation, at the time they had 10 days vacation, if you give vacation, you have to record it. Mm -hmm. So he went the opposite of constraint and sign, right? And because he believed the culture would respond accordingly. And they said, take as much vacation as you need. We don't have a formal, formal vacation policy. Which obviously is pretty risky, pretty uncomfortable deal at times. Mm -hmm. They found a number of vacations. You had to push boys out the door. They would grab executives and say, you have to take vacation. Mm -hmm. because we want to let them know that's important. Mm -hmm. right? Right, so it actually reduced the amount of vacation, reduced the amount of issues. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of not, let's say, tightening compliance, mm -hmm. uh -huh. but the culture better be strong enough to set that because if you didn't have that culture, uh -huh. you'd have employees out for 30 days at a time. Yeah. Yep. So, I I'd that so do you have an HR function? At no, I'm not. Okay. And we, and we have a formal, you know, right. HR policy, companies right. handbook, and all that great stuff. But, uh -huh. but I mean, the reality is. You know, are you gonna are you gonna treat the employees that that solely just want to come to work and get a paycheck mm -hmm. the same as the person that's gonna go above and beyond every time and do whatever it takes to help the company grow? Yeah. yeah. And and compliance tells you you gotta treat those two the same. Mm -hmm. Yep. But engagement. Doesn't. But engagement wise, you yeah. can't if you want to retain the good performance. So and I don't know if Evelyn could speak to. Well, performance. Uh, that's why you have a performance management. Well, yeah. Yeah. And you reward them differently. Right. So I, I, I just understand had the, the statement that you have to treat them the same. What, what, well, in I mean, what ways do you have to treat them the same? Is, right, just like, just like you right. said. Right, so you know, you're saying. Uh, I mean, you can't well, sexually it, harass them? No. No, I mean, no, no, no. No, no, no. no, no, I think the difference, right, because you're, you're in the construction right. industry, right? And so there's a lot of variance in workers in, in what you do. And I think it's, it's just a different world, right? We've, we've spent a lot of time with construction companies. So, I understand where you're coming from on that, right, from the compliance piece, because we want to have this standardized approach to HR, right, there's all this litigation on the horizon, even now with backgrounds, we can't ask about your background, we can't even ask about your salary anymore, so it's really scary. Um, so I think if we just have two different buckets, if we have the compliance where we are, you know, where we do have the vacation policy, but right. then if we associate something to an engagement program where it is based on performance and you can uh, specifically earn things that are in that category and we separate the buckets a little bit, they don't cross over. Um, but you're in a role where you're, you're doing it all that's super hard. For me, I, I have 28 people in, in my region. I cannot handle the compliance side. I'm right. terrible at it, but I want to hug you and buy Well, I mean, I get, here's an example. Yeah. You know, you have vacation days or PTO mm -hmm. days, right. and there's a defined number, and everybody sure. gets their defined number according mm -hmm. to their longevity. Well, let's say you have an employee that has something going on family-wise or, or whatever, and, and they're a great employee. You want to encourage them to help take care of their family. So, you know, uh, am I going to say, well, sorry, you took more than you all your vacation so, days, no, and I'm not going to pay you? a bonus day. So yeah. at, at Apple One, for example, we have a personal status change form, and I would document that as a gifted bonus day. I don't know if that's okay. Yeah, but is that a yeah. compliance? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, because it's documented. Okay. And everyone has the ability to earn a bonus day. But if you're setting smart goals with your people, okay. and you show that everyone's meeting standards, and this specific person, so then when someone comes up to you and they're not meeting standards, they don't get a performance day. I was um, getting ready to terminate somebody last year, and I said she gave me a favoritism, and HR said you're allowed to have favorites, right? And I was like, thanks. Yeah. Um, but so I, I think we're allowed to, and so if you have a standard. And I, I, I think, yeah, I think part of it is you know you have to plan it out. I think which I think one because I know we're running over. I think yeah, what we need sorry. to do is just make sorry. sure that. The message: Have a plan, and if you if you if you have a situation, don't know that's where you really need to. If you have an extra on staff, if not, engage someone. But I think going and spend and thinking through those options right. about community. You know, there there are companies exactly. that that will do community uh, pots for a PTO. In other words, you can contribute a certain percentage so no one else can use it. So, sorry, yeah. I know I know we've run yep. over. I want I more. Just, my... just, a, just a key. Uh, you know, we, we're a very sorry. compliance yeah. driven driven organization because we are an HR um, the, the key component when I got in there is to eliminate those things that people are calling compliance 
that are not compliance, they are simply preference. And, uh, and, and so, because and people smell that and, um, and then everything gets bad. We, and we can spend more time. Yeah, we love we, okay. thank you for our We run over, I apologize. Um, last thing, the assessment, the hacker group assessment, I, my, I, my email will going out. If you want to take it, two parts, 18 questions, some of it you'll need to get some numbers for, everybody can go through it. I, you don't have to be client. It doesn't have a client of mine. Nothing. You don't have to do business with me. It's a survey that we'll do. We'll help you see where HR is aligned, and then help you kind of figure out where some of your spend and other things are. There. I'll send them, I'll send an overview of it as well. But I just copy because it was free. No, I know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate everybody's contribution.